So how do you change your life? I became obsessed with this question 13 years ago. As a life coach, it's what I do for a living. I help people change their habits, change their mindset, create more of what they want. And now we're on this adventure, we're on this journey where we're gonna interview dozens of girls and women to find out how can they change their lives? How can we work together and come together in this bear movement and smash diet culture? It's a $60 billion industry that wants nothing more than to keep girls and women distracted on diets. Hi, I'm Susan Hyatt, Master Certified Life Coach and creator of The Bear Method. I have never created a documentary before, but come on along, we're gonna interview a ton of girls and women. There's gonna be stories about weight loss, weight gain, eating disorders, smashing diet culture. There might even be twerking, who knows? Come along. I wanna live in a world where girls and women feel powerful and strong and can show up and talk about politics and philanthropy and business and making money and taking up space and feel great about the impact that they're making in the world and are concerned about expanding their lives instead of just shrinking their waistlines. So how do we do that? How do we create a world where women are more concerned about their impact in the world than the size of their genes? This isn't a gender issue, this is a human issue. And if we wanna have a better world, we need all hands on deck. There's something that each and every one of us can do to contribute to healing this world problem. The first thing is pay attention. Pay attention to what you're telling yourself about your appearance and what matters and pay attention to how you talk to other people. Pay attention, pay attention to what's scrolling through your social media feed. Pay attention to advertisements. Pay attention to conversations you're participating in. Pay attention to what's coming at you through all your senses and the messages that you're receiving and anything that tells you that you're less than because of how you look, kick it to the curb. Opt out. So how did you actually start and wanted to be a life coach? That's such a good question. So um, I used to be a real estate agent. And so I sold houses and I was really good at it and I made a lot of money at it, but I didn't really love it. And I knew that there was something else I was meant to do, but I didn't know what. And so um, I was about 30 years old and I started trying to figure that out for myself. So I started reading a lot of self-help books and I found this book called Finding Your Own North Star and I bought it because I thought it was going to be a book about almost like a personality test where it would tell you what you should do and it was written by a woman named Dr. Martha Beck who called herself a life coach. I'd never heard of one. I started doing what was in the book and it was making me happier and happier and I thought wow there's something to this and so I went to her website and saw that she trained people to become what she called a life coach, which was really help people get what they want in life. And I decided to fly to Arizona and take a training class with her. And I wrote my business plan to leave real estate and start becoming a life coach. And so um, what I realized was that I really enjoyed the part of real estate that I liked, which was helping people get what they want, which was a different house. Um, I really loved helping people and I also loved to write and to speak and this job would let me do all those things. And so I trained for it and I started practicing with people who, they were my guinea pigs, if you will. They were my first um, test run clients and I loved it and I never looked back. So. Then I went on for more training and more training and it's been now um, almost 13 years. It's a fun gig. Are you interested? Mm, I think I'll stick with dancing. <laughs>
my lane in this health and diet industry is really to help women take back the power of their bodies and stop giving it away to an external plan, an external industry that benefits from you thinking that you're less than you are because the way that you showed up here tonight is enough. It's more than enough. Well, I think it's something that's so universal, regardless of your age or like where you are, everybody is struggling with what the world is telling them that they should look like. Have you ever overheard any of your friends or any girls at school talk about themselves negatively, that they don't look right or they think that they should look different? I think one girl, mm -hmm. I've heard her say it. What does she say? Well, there's a new app, there's like this app called TikTok, mm -hmm. and um, she does it, and um, and then she tells like the girls in our dance, um, like our waiting room mm -hmm. there, that she thinks that she's um, not pretty. I had food issues, but it wasn't because they were telling me anything negative. Mm -hmm. It had to be peers feeling like I needed to compete with them. Other girls, that's how your value was established, you know, how thin you were, how good you looked. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's television shows, it's magazines, it's hearing your friend's mom's talk. Mm -hmm. You know, she'd be a real pretty girl if mm -hmm. her face would thin out. Mm -hmm. Or the whole men are going to look at you and think one thing and want one thing. Right. Um, then you start to, to hide mm -hmm. because you don't want to be thought of that way or known that way or seen only as. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've always had a pretty good brain in my head and work in a, an industry that not a lot of women work in and do really well there. Mm -hmm. um, and just this message from a young age that none of that would matter because when people saw me, they thought only. And so what do you think gave you the idea that dieting would be winning? I mean, when you looked at magazines, mm -hmm. you know, all the girls were super thin. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was just part, I mean, my, my grandmother and my mother had always dieted. Mm -hmm. So it was just part of culture, I think. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those things where it's like thin was good mm -hmm. and not thin was bad. And mm -hmm. so I thought that that would be a way for me to be, to gain their love and support would be to get super thin. In my community, being fat, P-H-A-T, was a mm -hmm. thing. and and nobody wants a bone but a dog kind of thing. And so I was so skinny. There was a product that they advertised on Soul Train called Wait On. Yes! Yes! I've seen the ads for that. Wait On. I was Wait like, on. I want, Mom, can I buy some Wait On? That kind of, so, and then when I got older and I started picking up weight, then I was like, oh, this butt is too big. Mm -hmm. And I had this every time, I would ask my husband, how does this look? Is my butt too big? That was my obsession then. Right, right. So it's just so arbitrary. It, right, <laughs> back and forth, you can't win. I mean, it, it really is, it, diet culture sets up attitudes where women can't win. I grew up nothing but fat. Mm -hmm. Like I was the fat kid in kindergarten. I was the 250 pound graduate uh, of high school. And then I went on a diet for my wedding. Somehow I just sort of felt like I needed to be my absolute smallest um, for my wedding day, and I think that's a super common thing. It is a super common thing women do, yes. Yeah. Um, so I just ate very little, worked out a whole lot, met my goal weight by a tenth of a pound the night of our rehearsal dinner, mm -hmm. and from that point forward, I gained weight. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as I took the restrictive eating away, mm -hmm. and it was wildly and inappropriately, like unhealthily restrictive, mm -hmm. Um, whatever I had learned to trust, that trust was very fragile, apparently. Mm -hmm. Finally, during the summer bathing suit season, mm -hmm. and the girls would be taking those, there was diet pills you could mm -hmm. buy over the counter, mm -hmm. and started off doing that. Mm -hmm. And I did that for quite a while. Yeah. And it works, it mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. But I remember after I got my license, and I had to drive home one day, and put the car in park and I was feeling lightheaded. And when I went to move, I passed out. And I'm like, this is crazy. Unsubscribe from things that insult your soul. And not just online, in your physical space. Diet books, magazines, 
any companies or brands that pit women against each other, who wore it better, who has cellulite now, bikini pics that are unflattering, where magazines are making fun of models and actresses, don't support these companies and teach your children to do the same. So let me ask you this, how old were you when you first started dieting? Eight. Eight years old, which Eight. I don't know if you know this, that's the average age now that girls start dieting. Oh my God. I was probably in sixth or seventh grade when I first thought I felt fat, mm -hmm. comparing myself to everyone else, um, it being a big deal with all the girls. Mm -hmm. So pretty young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say it started as a teen mm -hmm. um, with my aunt not knowing that she was introducing diets mm -hmm. to me and my cousin. Mm -hmm. Um, where we started Weight Watchers mm -hmm. um, years ago with uh, my aunt and my mother mm -hmm. because they just wanted to feel better in their bodies too. But, you know, I internalized that as well as um, something I needed to do to improve my body mm -hmm. and to eat differently. Like what I was eating was not good. Mm -hmm. So we that's actually been part of my journey too. Yeah. Yeah, and always judging what I'm eating. Mm -hmm. It was somewhere between my eighth grade year and my ninth grade year. And what happened? Why did you start dieting? Um, I had made the cheerleading squad for mm -hmm. high school. I was super excited. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the only girl from my middle school who made the squad, so I didn't know any of the other girls. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls on the team started to bully me. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't really have a friend group and wasn't in with the other girls, I didn't really have any support of those girls. And um, the adults in my life at that time, they just didn't step in mm -hmm. and do anything about it. And so I was kind of left to deal with the whole thing on my own. And so my solution as a 13, 14 year old was that if I was the skinniest cheerleader, mm -hmm. that I would win, that I, that would be my way of like, I, I could get really skinny and then everyone would like me because I was the thinnest one. Mm -hmm. And so I started dieting. And um, I was eating these things called Slim Fast Bars. I remember Slim Fast Bars. Yeah, I was eating Slim Fast Bars and drinking the little Slim Fast Shakes. And I was riding, my parents had an exercise bike, one of those old fashioned, not Peloton, <laughs> but one of those like old fashioned Oh, uh, I bikes. remember those yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. And so I would like set that thing on like, you know, the, the highest yeah. setting. Yeah. And I would get on there and I would ride 20 or 30 miles a day. Wow. And so at the time I was five foot five. Mm -hmm. And I shrunk down to about 104 pounds, but I was super proud of myself because I, you know, done this thing. And because you had won. I had won, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, the bully continued to bully me, and the adults continued to not step in. And I, like, you know, the other girls were kind of like just didn't know what to do, mm -hmm. and um, I ended up quitting the cheerleading squad, and over the next three months, gained 35 pounds. Mm -hmm. I remember sneaking off into the woods uh, at a retreat that my aunt and uncle were having. My parents were not there, and my sister and I were there. It was the first summer I was on Weight Watchers, and my very um, by-the-book aunt had taken over the, the booklet of what I was supposed to eat, and so I'd been on a very strict regimen all week, and uh, <laughs> they were religious, which my family was not, and they, <laughs> they were having a big banquet outside in the woods, a big buffet thing, and um, they all bowed their heads to pray. And so I saw my dance, and as they were all praying with their heads down, I ran over and grabbed the German chocolate cake, and as I was running back to the woods to eat the whole cake, my sister Heidi, who also felt out of her element in the religious group, was like, Sonia! And the cake flipping up into the air, and I was like, no! No! I was reaching for the cake, of course it landed, you know, frosting side down. It's the first time I've literally ever punched my sister, first and last. I grew up in an Indian culture, mm -hmm. and um, every time you went to a party, all your aunties and uncles, but the aunties would always say, oh my God, you look awesome, but how much weight have you gained? Uh, Immediately. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. Like, that's what you heard all the time. So I grew up with that mental thing of like, mm -hmm. I'm too heavy, maybe I don't look great, and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you start hiding. How old were you when you first started covering up, deciding that you didn't like the way that you looked? Man, that's a good question. I mean, I do feel like in my teens, I actually remember a really clear moment when that happened because I felt very free in my body as a young woman. And I used to wear the teeniest bikinis and I didn't think anything of it. Like I didn't think, oh, I'm wearing skimpy clothes. I was just like, I'm just wearing stuff and it's fun. This is a cute color and just put it on, you know, right. not really thinking about it. But there's a particular moment, I think I was 16, and I remember I was like coming home, we lived on a hill and I was coming down the hill. And my mom was like, 
walking into our apartment building, so we sort of met in the front. And she's like, what are you wearing? You know? Because I had on like this little tank top thing that was cropped and these short shorts. And she's like, I can't believe you walked around like that all day. And I think since then, I was like, oh no, this is too much. Because mm -hmm. I've always had a big booty, mm -hmm. which now I love, right? Yeah, but like, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, wait, does this make my butt look big? Good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, oh no, I need to hide. So I would wear, it's so funny because when I met my husband, he was like, I feel like you're like purposely putting on something that looks like a tent. <laughs> Every chance you get. <laughs> I was always trying to like, like I wanted to be like a triangle, like just wear something that was so far from touching my body so no one could see anything. Right. So I think there was just a lot of shame, mm -hmm. honestly, about my body. And even honestly being cat called so much, I grew up in New York City and that was a big part um, of my childhood. And so I felt like I was responsible for mm -hmm. all of that attention yeah. negative attention that I didn't want so my answer to that was like oh this is a this is not good so just cover all that shit up mm -hmm. how old were you when you first started to notice you had thoughts that were negative about food or body oh <laughs> nine yeah eight maybe eight or nine yeah eight is the average age that girls start dieting just, today yeah and so what what diets over the years did you try? Oh boy, that's it. Oh, it just breaks my heart really to think about that mm -hmm. because I think the first one I did were these little um, caramel chew appetite suppressants. I'd forgotten about those. And yeah, I, I think they were called AIDS. Oh my gosh, <laughs> right? which is right. like. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. But yeah, so it, it was it was like this little sweet treat yep. that you could eat that would suppress your appetite. Nine. Wow. Going to the drugstore, buying those for myself at nine. I was always skinny my entire life, very thin. Um, in fact, that was the thing that was special about me. I was very skinny. So when I turned about 40, weight started piling on to some degree and um, I was confused. Who am I if I'm not the skinniest person in the room? I tried Weight Watchers, I tried Nutrisystem, I tried Low Carb, and all of those took off a few pounds, but they weren't sustainable. They weren't natural eating. Mm -hmm. And so I joined Bear to lose weight, but I had no idea that it was gonna be so much more. I hope you enjoyed the documentary. Remember, there are three ways to become a leader in the Bear movement. Join Bear Nation, our free Facebook group, so that you can be in a community of like-minded women. You can also apply to become a Bear Certified Life Coach. This is a life-changing program where I not only teach you the art of coaching, but I teach you the art of making money in a life coaching business. And the third way is to join Bear Daily, which is a low-cost membership community where we have lots of classes, lots of videos and downloads and ways to support you as you integrate Bear into your daily life. I hope you'll join us and become part of a life-changing movement. It's time to get Bear. Who stands out to you as like your favorite role model? Um, I like Jackie Young. Jackie Young? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? I like this girl, Victoria Vivens. Skylar Diggins. Skylar yeah. Diggins, why? Um, I just feel like she plays hard and just stands out. Mm -hmm. So, when you think about a strong female athlete, what do you think is important to be an effective, strong athlete? You gotta put in work. You gotta put in the work, yep. You have to eat right. Mm -hmm. hmm? You have to eat right. You have to eat right. Show effort. Show effort. Love who they are. <laughs> Love who you are, right? Anything else? Being positive. <laughs> Being positive. And you need to stay humble. Oh, stay humble. I'm not very good at that. I gotta work on that. I gotta work on that. All right, so we've heard like they put in the work, they're positive, they stay humble, they eat right, they love themselves. When you were imagining who you might pick as your favorite female athlete, did the idea come into your mind at all that they should be as thin as possible? No. No, that's ridiculous, right? 
part of my work is helping girls and women stop buying into what culture teaches us through social media and commercials and magazines and movies um, that women should spend their time dieting and shrinking themselves to be as small as possible. So when you think about everything that you do, you just finished practice. And what all did you do here at practice? Shoot. Shooting, shooting run, 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 running, stretching. Um, I think I saw you all lift. go to the weightlifting yeah. room. Yeah. Yeah. Bent, bench, bench, squats, squats, squats lunges, lunges. Pull ups, pull ups. Yeah. Um, does your coach ever talk about your muscles needing to be smaller? No. 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 <laughs> That's like outlandish, right? It's ridiculous. Um, one of the things that is alarming um, in the thousands of women that I've helped is when I ask them where they first got the idea to start dieting, the average age that a girl starts dieting in our culture is eight years old. And the whole reason I devoted myself to this work, right, like eight years old, was um, when my daughter was in the fourth grade. She came home from school and everybody in the fourth grade is like nine, 10 years old. And I was unpacking her lunchbox. And she said to me that, um, she said, hey mom, every girl at the cafeteria table today made a pack to go on a diet together and not eat their lunch. And she was like, that's messed up, right? And I was like, yeah, that's messed up. And I decided that I couldn't not continue this work because there were cafeterias all over the world full of little girls who were getting the idea from their older sisters or their moms or their grandmas or um, you know their dads or coaches that they should eat less so that they were thin and I wanted to talk to some strong female athletes because I know that what goes into the work that you do is about being powered up instead of shrinking so, um, have any of you ever tried to diet? I know by the time a woman's my age, she has dieted about 30 years of her life, which is crazy, right? So in my work with, with girls and women, um, it's rare that someone hasn't tried dieting. Is anybody currently on a diet? No. No? <laughs> I've tried it, but it didn't last long. <laughs> which, which diet did you try? I tried a, um, like, no red meat. No red meat. Yeah. And That's like real trendy right now yeah. to like not eat meat. It didn't last long. No. Why not? Because I was craving some <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else try any diet? I just try to eat healthy. Yeah. What does eating healthy look like for you? Not junk food all the time. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite junk food? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I like honey buns. I like honey buns. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like ramen noodles. That's what I eat. Oh my gosh, I was just talking to someone about ramen noodles. Back in the day, I could put down some ramen noodles. They were good, but, but they're very Oh my salty. gosh, they're so full of like that little packet of chemicals. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right, so honey buns, ramen, anybody else? Brownies. What'd you say? Brownies. Brownies. Or like a cookie with some ice cream on top. Oh yeah. 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 Cookies with ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> right, and so it's ridiculous to think that any of us would go through life without eating things like that, and yet the media wants to make it into a moral issue, like you're, you're having a good day or you're being a good girl if you don't eat those things. And part of my work is just encouraging girls and women to move in ways that feel like love, which you guys were, were already doing. How many of you love basketball? I mean, right, you wouldn't be putting in this work if you didn't, I'm sure, because it's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and eat in ways that feel like love. So if red meat, right, is powers your body up, then that's absolutely what you should be eating. I'm curious if any of you have ever gotten a message either from anybody in your family or peer group or even if it's like picking it up from magazines or movies, that you should look different than you do. I've seen just workout videos that you should be doing and stuff like that. I have before, cause like I was really skinny and like my family, they told me that I need to eat more to fill out my body. But that's pretty much mm -hmm. it. 
Right. It can go either way. Like it, it's not just weight loss, but it's also, you know, thin shaming can happen where I know my mom is 76 years old, but when she was in high school, Marilyn Monroe was the ideal and she was very thin and there were products on the market um, to gain weight and, and, and ads that were like, never look thin at the beach again. <laughs> right. And fast forward. Right. Like to today, who's the who's the ideal today? would you say the cultural ideal of of uh, what a woman should look like? Beyonce. Kylie Jenner. Beyonce, Kardashian. Kylie Jenner. Yeah. Kardashian. The Kardashians. The Kardashians. It went from um, like Twiggy to Marilyn Monroe, and then it swung to like Farrah Fawcett and all of these different cultural ideals, and now it's come all the way back around to like Kardashians and cosmetic surgery, Kylie Jenner. And no matter what the decade, girls and women are, are taught like how you look is not okay. And so my work is to help empower women. But it is that how you look and how you are is amazing. So I would love to know what you're most grateful for in being a strong female athlete. Like, isn't it amazing that your bodies can do what it can do? Like, yeah. I was watching you guys practice. I was watching you. I'm like, she's shorter than me. And look at her <laughs> seeking those baskets, right? Like, it's amazing what our bodies can do. Um, what are you most proud of? Um, <laughs> having the ability to yeah. play this sport. Yeah, yeah. yeah the and, ability to play this sport. And if you were talking to one of those fourth graders, like my daughter's cafeteria table when she was in the fourth grade, and you heard a group of fourth grade girls, nine and 10 year old girls saying that they're not gonna eat their lunches today, what would you say to that? Don't what be a the heck's going yeah. on? Don't be a follower, <laughs> would you say? What the heck's going on? What the heck is going on? I would tell them to eat their food. Yeah. yeah. Eat their food. Because then they yeah. won't have like energy and yeah. just be like, sluggish. Exactly. That's what I said to my daughter. And she went back to school the next day and she was like, my mom said we have to eat our lunches so we have energy to clap back at the boys. <laughs> like, the thing that I love is that after coaching thousands of women over the past almost 13 years, I've put together a process that I think anybody could do for free. Um, and it and it really starts with people always want to start with well tell me what to eat but I start with something I call environmental detox where it, it's really just about becoming awake in your own life and paying attention to what you're tolerating what's coming at you through all of your senses not just what you're eating but what you're consuming what you're viewing what you're listening to um, and making changes from there um, Yes, I talk about eating in terms of not good or bad foods, but foods that power you up versus foods that you eat just for pleasure and you get to have both. I also talk, yes, about movement and sweat, but moving from a place of what feels like love. And I think that's one of the biggest guiding principles of the bear process is eat in a way that feels like love, move in a way that feels like love. I also talk quite a bit and it's the foundation of all my work. Uh, something called mind detox, which is a, how do you talk to yourself? Eavesdropping on what's happening in your mind and thinking thoughts that power you up. Just like the food you eat should power you up, so should the thoughts that you think. Um, yes, there is some fun work in the closet, closet detox, but it's really about adorning your body in a way that sparks joy, that feels like love. Um, not hiding under a bunch of clothes, not wearing things um, just to feel good enough, but truly adorning yourself in a way that's empowering. My favorite step in the whole thing is make a scene, be seen. And this is at the end of the process where so much fun can happen for a woman, a girl or a woman who decides to advocate for herself, to stand up for herself, to be seen in the world and to stop hiding. So those seven steps are simple, but when applied are powerful. It was one of those things where it was exactly what I needed at the exact moment. So I jumped in with both feet on Miracle Week and um, I think I cried every day that I was part of Miracle Week because 
everything that you were saying that we needed to do, everything that you talked about, I didn't realize how much I needed it in my life. I was just, I was at a point where I was exhausted mm -hmm. from everything. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I honestly just think it's like a cultural thing because, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's just so insidious mm -hmm. that we don't even notice it happening. Culturally, I was just surrounded by these images of, of this is the way men are and this is the way women are and this is just, you just accept it. Right. And it never occurred to me to fight back because, you know, feminists were bad, mm -hmm. you know, feminists were evil. God, you know, God forbid you be a feminist, you know. Yeah, now that's God all forbid. Yes. <laughs> that's all out the window. So yeah, so I, you know. Welcome to the new wave. Exactly. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. So me glad. Too. Thank yeah. you. Today we live in this body positivity culture, but they don't ever actually teach you how to love your body. They just say you should love your body, so love it, but they don't teach you how. So I feel like the book really aligned those steps of how to love your body. So if you were to describe how you felt about food and body prior to any of the challenges or learning there, how would you say you felt about yourself? Mm, a little bit more unconscious. Mm -hmm because it was unconscious eating, mm -hmm. mainly. Um, so it, that's why attentive eating also made a big difference for me. Mm -hmm. um, because I just wanted, to, I was looking to feel better in my body and attentive eating helped with that because I was able to pay attention to what it was saying to me. Right. Um, and it actually helped me get over my perimenopausal plateau, as I call it, <laughs> because I was holding steady for a while and I just didn't feel well mm -hmm. um, in my body. And I believe that's one of the things that made a really big difference for me. Yeah. Shame, mm -hmm. for sure. I just felt shame. I felt embarrassed. I felt like I wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. I felt like... You know, people constantly compliment my face, but I just felt like, I, it's like I wanted to put my face on the internet, but not, nothing else. Yeah. Like, oh, but what this face is attached to is bad. I would say not enough. Mm. Yeah. So the belief that you weren't enough. Correct. Yeah. Equating how I was treating myself, that I had those thoughts constantly that I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was a really corny song from the 1980s, and it, it was called, I've Never Been to Me. Mm. And that sums up perfectly how I felt before Bear. I'd never been an authentic, real person because I was always people pleasing. And there are things in my past that um, make sense and why I ended up like this, but I don't have to be like this forever. So with Bear's help, I am making a scene. I am detoxing people from my life. I'm doing a lot of other things that I never really thought I would do. I had put this disordered eating under so many layers that I couldn't even see it yeah. for what it was. Right. You know, and it, what it is is not listening to my body yeah. and not trusting myself to know what I need to put inside me and what I don't need to put inside me. Right. My mother was very heavy mm -hmm. growing up and I did not really realize it until I remember this clear as day. I'm 46 years old now, you and I are the same yeah, age. Yeah, we are. I was second grade and my mom had to come into my classroom mm -hmm. to sign papers or do something. And I'm running ahead and I get into the classroom and then my mom comes in and I started looking around. It was like, it was almost like I was an out of body experience. And I remember these kids like laughing and poking fun at my mom and making like piggy faces or oinky noises and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God. And I ran into the bathroom mm -hmm. and hid. Mm -hmm. And my teacher came to get me. And since that point, I was like, I'm not going to be like that. Mm -hmm. And I felt terrible because I felt like I had disrespected my mother by doing that but I was so ashamed mm -hmm. with her appearance and so that started me up like and then you know how people are saying well look at her mom so you know how she's gonna turn out mm, right and so I had that in my head so that really started the unhealthy thinking about body image and what my weight should be like so you know however you however old you are at second, second grade, grade which is what seven yeah probably seven years yeah. old so I had that and then, um, but my mother, if she would start a diet, my sister and I would do the diet with her as kind of like a joint effort. Uh. And it's funny because she would never finish it and my sister and I would always take it out to how many days, like if it was three weeks of eating cottage cheese and peaches or whatever, wow. we would sit there and stuff that down. So it was really, um, 
really unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And then, um, like workout, remember Richard Simmons workout? Oh, group? totally. So we would go to the workout sessions with her, but really as a motivator for her. But I'm thinking to myself, I mean, how healthy is that for a nine year old? Right. Um, so I would eat, um, and run up and down the stairs after each meal or run around the block. Mm-hmm. Um, I would restrict of fat, grams, calories, whatever, all mm-hmm. throughout junior high, high school, especially in college. Um, my mom died when I was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, so at you know, that point, I, again, I was not going to be like my mother and be overweight. So back in the early 90s when fat-free was like the craze, yeah, I remember. only allowed myself five grams of fat a day. Wow. And I was like, you know, I'm five, almost 5'7", five, mm-hmm. and I was like 110 pounds. Wow. Yeah, very anorectic, mm-hmm. um, tiny. And mm-hmm. all my friends were like, you're so tiny. And I'm like, I didn't see it. So that body dysmorphia. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it took a lot. Mm-hmm. And until probably my 40s that I realized. And then in my 30s, things, after I had babies, things got a little bit more difficult and I got like more serious about diet and start reading like every new diet book that came on the market I would read it and I would try it and I would be disappointed what were name some of the diets you tried in your 30s oh the zone diet um oh my gosh I was never I, I, don't, I didn't like counting calories because mm-hmm. I counted calories when I was in high school and that was terrible mm-hmm. so I kind of stayed away from Weight Watchers and all of that kind of thing but I think it was more like you would read a diet about like oh if you eat, only eat these foods then you'll just naturally be the weight that you're supposed to be. Or if you only eat those other foods, mm-hmm. you'll naturally be the weight that you'll be. So it was more of those types of diets mm-hmm. where I was like trying to like, you know, eat grapefruits, you know, for breakfast. <laughs> and then you'll magically be the right size. Right. What was your experience with food? What did what did you discover once you started mindfully eating that you used to do? Oh, that I was always looking at a screen, Mm. that I wasn't really paying attention, that my mind was like, always like, how much can I eat so I don't have to eat again anytime soon? Oh, so like efficiency with your eating. Oh, yes. Let me load up now (laughs) so I don't have to stop and bother with this later. Right. Oh, precisely. Interesting. Oh, yeah. And I was was really good at it. I still catch myself doing that every Mm -hmm. once in a while. It's Mm -hmm. like, no, we're going to slow down. And I think part of it for me was I don't want to have to take the time mm-hmm. because it will take too long mm-hmm. to take care of myself. Uh, so it, you know, like just sort of reverse engineering that and, mm-hmm. you know, putting that first and, mm-hmm. oh, I magically felt better. Right. I can sit at a table without a screen and yeah, I catch myself as well. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, don't no sit at a table. Mm-hmm. Don't go back to your desk and eat while you're doing something else. Right. Um, and so, all right, so after Miracle Week, then mm-hmm. you read the book? I joined Bear Daily oh, right. immediately okay. because I had just joined Weight Watchers. Okay, I don't think I knew that. Yes, all so right. like two, like at the beginning of January was when you were doing Miracle Week. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, I can't take this weight. This is really bothering me. This is a problem. Da, 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 da. And so I joined Weight Watchers and I was about two weeks in Mm -hmm. and, you know, counting up all my little points and Mm -hmm. tracking everything and spending hours a day trying to figure out what I was going to eat. And then that, that was when I joined the Miracle Week and I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. Bear Daily, this is a thing. Right. Oh, okay. So I immediately canceled my, (laughs) my, (laughs) sorry, not sorry. Yeah, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. The Weight Watchers went away Mm -hmm. and I put that money toward working with you. I've done Weight Watchers, I've tried all of the MLM companies, the It Works, the Thrive, any pill you can look at in the Walgreens aisle, the Slim Fast, the Special K, I'm like everything, I've tried everything. So you tried all the diets, the pills, and then I think when you and I met, you had just scheduled a surgery. I wanted to get gastric bypass or the sleeve is what I wanted to get because I felt defeated. Mm -hmm. I've tried everything. Um, I was successful for three or four weeks and then I would bounce back because Mm -hmm. the problem wasn't really where I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Um, So I never actually went through with anything, obviously, surgery-wise, but that was the route I was headed. Self-care is an act of rebellion. In a world that wants you to take up less space sit down, be quiet, comply. This is the most rebellious, dangerous thing a woman can do. I was getting ready to turn 40 years old. So it was kind of the cliche, it's gonna be the second half of my life, so to speak. So how do I wanna live? What do I wanna do? And I was thinking about 
people will often ask me, what was the moment? What was the thing? Because tr my life changed dramatically in terms of when you and I worked together, habits and a way of thinking about my life. And then the whole metamorphosis of how I looked then mm -hmm. and how I look now. And it wasn't just about losing the weight, which I did, but it was about stepping into a part of myself that just had to shine outward. I was saying to your husband before we started filming that, you know, I do a lot of business online and it was so amazing for me to be like, we found each other through a Facebook ad. I know. And randomly popped up. <laughs> right? And so you clicked on that. You joined Miracle Week. What happened for you that week? What did you notice? I originally joined because I had read, you know, lose weight without dieting. And mm -hmm. of course, me trying everything in the book, I'm like, oh, lose weight without dieting? Great. Like, I want to do that. Of course, there were other things mentioned, like get better sleep and whatnot. But I was, I actually joined for the weight loss portion. Mm -hmm. But, and it was funny because through the challenges that you were giving, I know before day three, when you did attentive eating, I was thinking, well, where's this going with weight loss? <laughs> like, where's the diet? When are we going to get to losing weight? Because I've made my corner pretty, you know, but when am I going to lose weight? You know, the, mm -hmm. the hookah corner is what I'm referring to. But, mm -hmm. um, what I discovered was that the pleasure aspect, mm -hmm. having things to look forward to other than food, mm -hmm. um, the mind detox, realizing that there, I'm not hopeless. I'm not broken. Mm -hmm. There are other things going on. That was a huge deal for me, and I was like super happy that I ran across your post because that was not what I expected to find. Yeah. I was just looking for another quick fix like I always had. I would love to know how you first found out about Bear. Because I attended your clear coaches. Oh, that's right. Yes. That's right. I came to Savannah to meet the queen. <laughs> And you kept talking about this bear thing. And that was right when I was in the midst of that, my fitness pal and all that tracking and mm -hmm. I was over it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, is this real? This sounds so good. I had spent a whole decade offering myself up to taking care of my family, mm -hmm. building my career. I had four miscarriages in two years mm -hmm. and adopted a baby boy. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about a quote that I saw from Beyonce recently, which she just did an interview about having all of her miscarriages before she had her little girl. And um, she said, having lost all those babies, she realized in order to be a mother, she had to learn to mother herself. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what I started to realize. Yeah. So you helped me understand that. And so it's not just, I thought it was about losing about 25 and it ended up being about 35 pounds, but I knew when I found you that it was gonna be more than that. Mm -hmm. And it was. One of the ladies in the Bear Daily group posted about this and it was just like my aha moment. What did she post? She posted a, a thing about um, disordered eating mm -hmm. and talking about how she I think she had been working with a trainer and she had been doing like paleo style eating mm -hmm. and intermittent fasting and some weird things like that mm -hmm. and I was like holy hell <laughs> that's me yeah and, you know and I have been telling myself probably for like the last 10 years it's like oh yeah I don't diet mm -hmm. I just eat healthy and I just do this but I was doing all that crazy stuff I think and, that that's a really good point because so many people think that they're just creating a new lifestyle and that right. they're just being healthy, but it's another um, gimmick disguised as health that's a diet. Right, because right. men are not gonna go on diets. Mm -hmm. Like a man's not gonna do Weight Watchers or go mm -hmm. on a diet, not like not really, Not they're not gonna admit it, mm -hmm. but they'll do intermittent fasting or they'll mm -hmm. do uh, these other, you know, bro types of things that right. kind of, you know, allow them to be 3% body fat without mm -hmm. having to you know, go around talking about how they're on a diet. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so you saw a post on Facebook, and then what happened? Well, it just really kind of like opened me up to the fact that I really had a bigger issue with food than I actually was willing to admit that I had. Mm -hmm. And when I, and it made me really step back and go, oh yeah, like I'm, the amount of time that I was wasting thinking about what I was going to eat mm -hmm. or what I was not going mm -hmm. to eat mm -hmm. or when I was going to eat or how much I was going to eat. And it was always about like portion control or, or just controlling the, um, the, 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 what I was putting in my body. Right. And then, and then I was weighing myself mm -hmm. like no joke. 
I, and I, this is not even an exaggeration, I would weigh myself at least 20 times a day. And when I say like 20 is like a low number, like every time I would walk past my closet and I work from home, mm -hmm. I was like on the scale, on the scale, mm -hmm. on the scale. And what were you hoping in those 20 times a day, I've been there, mm -hmm. that you were weighing yourself? What were you hoping you would see? Just a lower number. Yeah. I went to your retreat, your Italy retreat. Yes. And that was the first time that we kind of worked together and you know, we connected in person. So that was a life-changing experience. I came back a completely different person. I, rem I remember that retreat because I remember we were debating whether or not you should buy a hat. <laughs> and the whole time I was like, buy the hat. Yes. The whole trip. The yes. Whole trip. And it was really about being seen. Yes. And investing in yourself. That's been huge for me. Cause I was, I was definitely, can you even imagine now? No. Like, <laughs> I was a completely different person. You were. Because I just had these layers of like, just hide it, mm -hmm. you know? And that that Italy retreat really kind of cracked me open. And I came home and I was like, recording videos and doing like, see me world, here I am. <laughs> and before that, I really was very timid, you know? Mm -hmm. I have this old YouTube channel like with videos early, you know, in my career. And I was like, whisper. <laughs> like, like I really didn't want nobody to hear me. <laughs> I can't, I can't even imagine. I know, it. right? I, know. <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, I remember you pre-bear, pre-coaching, um, and just, just being able to see, yeah, you for who you really were, yes. and being like, oh, we gotta wake this up. Exactly, yeah. it was like dormant. Yeah. You know, like when your real self and your real personality mm -hmm. is hiding. And actually, when I came to Italy, I was fresh off of a ridiculous diet. It, it was extreme, and you go in and get weighed constantly. It was just, it was nuts. So, it was so perfect, you know, mm -hmm. to go, I'm so glad there was like something that told me I needed to be there. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad because that's sort of the, the journey that I was on, really yeah. hating my body and obsessing over like food and all of this bullshit, yeah. you know, and feeling like I had to hide myself because I don't look, you know, the way that I looked when I was younger or the way that I imagined that I should look or the way that the world says that you should look sometimes, right. you know? I met you recently at Barnes & Noble at my book signing and you came with your mom to hear me talk. What, when you listen to that, what stood out to you or what do you think applies to your life as a nine-year-old? Younger people, mm -hmm. we don't really care as much, mm -hmm. but more people care mm -hmm. when you're older. Mm. And you get older and you want to be more like someone else. Mm -hmm. And really when you're just like younger, you don't really care. Right, I would agree with you. I think when you're your age and younger, you're closer to the truth, which is that you're awesome how you are. Learn how to compliment girls and women on something other than how much they weigh and how they look. When you see your friend in the grocery store, compliment her on things like, hey, I saw you got that advanced degree, way to go. Instead of, hey, looks like you lost a few pounds. Learn how to compliment little girls on their bravery, their boldness, their intellect, their compassion, their empathy, their kindness, their creativity. There's so much to a human other than how good they look. What part of either what you read in the book or what you've experienced in the world with me mm -hmm. regarding the bear process stands out to you as pivotal? I think it's the inviting the pleasure in mm -hmm. because I think we live in such a pain inducing society mm -hmm. that's like, just shrink yourself, you know, versus what would happen if we invited pleasure into our lives, which I think is then when the lessons actually come. Like on our trip in Italy, mm -hmm. I was just blown away by how much I learned about myself and how I interact with others simply by experiencing pleasure. And so one, thank you. <laughs> and two, it's then something that I can then share with my students and with our parents because I just don't think any of us are getting enough of it. It's a 
mix between pleasure and mind detox were the mm -hmm. ones that stood out to me the most. Mm -hmm. Mind detox because I didn't realize that there were other underlining issues, um, things I needed to work on, which is painful in the beginning because you don't want to confront those things. Um, sometimes it's almost easier to think, hey, I'm broken than to realize mm -hmm. the story is what's causing all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the pleasure as well, realizing that I can find joy in other things other than looking forward to dinner at night, you know, like going mm -hmm. on that walk or appreciating a sunset. Um, taking time to look pretty, you know, yeah. um, just it, that was, those stood out to me the most. Yeah. The one was the closet detox mm -hmm. and one particular section of my closet that made the biggest difference, um, this year. And I decided to break down my closet instead of doing everything at once. Uh, so I decided one night to do my lingerie drawer. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed when I started pulling things out is that none of it was me and none of it I bought for myself. So I realized that there was another person in my closet who was actually um, there for other people and putting other people before myself. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up getting rid of a lot of that lingerie and buying more of what made me happy instead. Yep. And that was just really one of the biggest changes for me. One of the things that you've taught me that I hold on to is um, exercise is not transactional. Mm -hmm. I've uh, another facet of my career is in fitness, mm -hmm. and um, I teach it through group fitness and personal training. That was such an awakening to me. Yeah, because you went from I, I would run, I would do off and on. I would run, and then I get sick of it, and and then I had. I still have issues with my knees and I was like well I can't do anything and you were like we need to find something you love and um, as you know I found the first thing that I just absolutely loved and crushed was Zumba it was yes! the big thing and you go to Zumba and cry oh I just dancing and the joy of that um, the only thing you own is this beautiful body now culture tells us like you're supposed to do this shape it think about it all the time obsess about it tear it apart I'm like how do you treat it like as exquisitely as possible? What experiences do you want to give it? Because it's with you the first breath you take and also when you leave on earth. You don't own your kids, although you may think you do. They let you know <laughs> that you don't. <laughs> my kid, my kids have two kids. Yeah, but my, uh, yeah we've had that in common. <laughs> that Cora and Ryan yeah. Hyatt are like, no ma'am. Right. Um, our spouses, our businesses, tangible things, they're all beautiful things we've created. but. You know, we have this, which houses this and this, and um, that's the greatest gift. So when I talk to people about exercise, people think, you know, when I exercise that I'm, you know, like in prayer and exuberant joy. I do shit that is hard, mm -hmm. but I also do things that are very loving and gentle. I just am so grateful and proud that I can do it versus I got to get in there and you know, if I ate a Snickers bar, how much of that is this gonna burn off? And that's how I used to think right. like that. And right. I think because I carried my weight in a certain way, I had a shame, I wanted to take better care of my body and some of that was losing weight. And if people looked at me because of my height and how I carried my weight, they'd be like, you don't need to, live. what are you talking about? So I would diet in secret. Mm -hmm. That's the, uh, some women like talk about it all the time, but I was like, I, I wanna, you know, take better care of myself and maybe change the way I eat food and move, but I didn't want to tell anybody about it, so. Something you said early on really hit home for me, and that was the the transactional relationship mm -hmm. between movement and myself. Like right. that I was exercising to punish myself or exercising because I wanted to look a certain way mm -hmm. instead of it being about pleasure. Yeah. And that's that has radically shifted. Right, so, right, because now I think you are inside the Peloton cult with me. <laughs> oh, it's the and best. And I say that lovingly. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, prior to Bear, what was your experience with exercise? Transactional, mm -hmm. um, anything else about that that is different now? Oh, everything is different now. Now it's it's for the, the pleasure of moving, mm -hmm. of how how I feel, how I show up, mm -hmm. what, um, yeah, there, it's, it is it's truly about pleasure for me. It's not yeah. about anything else. That is like, I think that for me, as somebody who was anti-exercise, yes. uh, I would not, I was the biggest couch potato ever and wouldn't move, you can't make me move, right? And like, it's like a 
miracle. It like is. now we're women who look forward yeah. to getting on that bike yeah. and riding with our favorite instructors and with each other. Yes. Um, and then it's self care. Yeah. Um, I had to get rid of some of the people in my life who were toxic, mm -hmm. and that was um, really hard to do. Yeah. Um, friendships that had lasted 10 plus years, but I didn't like the person I was becoming mm -hmm. um, when I had those friendships. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing that I, that I took on. What were the kind of behaviors that you were participating in that you were like, okay, enough? Gossip was the, the mm -hmm. worst one. They say that women are often their own worst enemies, mm -hmm. and I find in these relationships, or girlfriend relationships that I had, that was so true. They would be nice on the service, and behind people's backs, they would just tear them down. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be that person, but I found myself, when I was around these people, to be accepted, participating in all of that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I didn't like the person I was becoming. So talking to Bear coaches on Bear Daily and um, in doing the tools, the different weeks, I thought it doesn't have to be this way. I want a change. And so I made one. You know, one of the things that was so impactful for me that I think is so unique about Bear that makes it so different from everything else out there is the emphasis on pleasure. Mm -hmm. Cause I, when I looked around in my life, I was like, oh, my life is fucking devoid of pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. I'm just like dealing with kids and working and making clients happy and just pleasing other people all day long and there's no pleasure. So like I would, <laughs> for my pleasure, my pleasure, I would bake all weekend long and then just eat, eat all the shit that oh I baked. Oh my God. <laughs> Cause I was just trying to get a moment of happiness. You know what I mean? Yeah, trying to get all your entertainment, joy, yeah, and comfort. It's, I wasn't necessarily depressed. I was just, it was like all my senses were like dulled. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest challenge for girls in middle school? I feel like everybody's always talking about, oh, so many people want to date me and all that stuff. People like me and then other people, some people are like, nobody likes me. Do you ever feel pressure to look a certain way? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, just because all of like models and stuff, that's all that's in your feed. Like if Instagram, that's all that's in your feed. And um, of course they get like billions of likes and stuff like that. So I guess a lot of people feel like, hey, I don't look that way. And they do and everyone likes them and everyone likes how they look. You know, maybe I should look like them. So have you ever avoided food because you were afraid it would make you gain weight? Um, I've definitely thought about how many like maybe calories or maybe how much sugar or fat is in a certain food, and I'll sometimes I'll take that into mind. Okay. Um, do you enjoy eating that food? Would you, even though it has like the calories and the sugar? Like, yeah, like ice cream, for example. Like I love ice cream, but it's super unhealthy. But I'll still eat it because okay. I really enjoy it. And when do you feel the most insecure? <laughs> Usually when you're doing something new or out of the box or if you see or if you start comparing yourself to others. Okay and so why do you think uh, we compare ourselves to others so frequently? Just because it's always it's always fed at us it's just it's kind of just part of our human nature and there's so much that we see every single day that's being thrown at our, our senses and that's just how we take it in. Right, so I agree 100% that it is just part of our human nature to compare, but um, at times it becomes unhealthy, right, when we start comparing too much. Very. So how do you think that um, young girls, how do you think young girls can change that? Um, I would say mostly just finding a good group of people that'll support you and they'll lift you up instead of bring you down and then just being confident in who you are and what you look like and what you do. Awesome. Love it. So, and that comes down to thinking about, okay, if we're a bold girl, right, our, and how we feel about our bodies and how we treat our bodies, that's what really matters, right? Like, oh, that self-love that comes into play getting to the point of looking at the photo and thinking it's okay that I don't look like her. Have you ever felt like you needed to um, 
restrict what you're eating or go on a diet because of what you've seen? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, you know, they, um, now not even with social media, it's movies and TV shows that these models or people that have these figures are on and they explain like, oh my gosh, or even advertising, oh my gosh, like this vitamin shake, this milkshake that can help you like this uh, curve and you want to be like hey what if I try that maybe I'll lose some weight or maybe I'll start to look like them more. Have you tried any diets yourself? Um yeah I've tried to cut down on what I've eaten um, and personally I didn't think like I was eating anything bad but I thought that maybe just cutting down would make me lose weight. And what do you love most about yourself? Um I love my smile because my smiles are contagious. Thank you. <laughs> what does being a bold girl mean to you? I think being a bold girl means like you are not afraid to be who you are and you have so much confidence in yourself and confidence in other people too. Ooh, I like that. You want to be confident and you want to be strong in your opinions. And I think you just want to be okay with yourself and with who you are. Okay, so Allie, when do you feel the most confident? Um, usually you feel most confident when you're surrounded by people who are bringing you up. Whenever you're around the people you love the most. So why do you think that that environment makes you feel good? Because I know all of them and I know that if anything would happen to me, they would have my back. Thanks for being here. My pleasure to be here. So Judy, you're one of my bear certified coaches and quite talented at that, if Thank I say you. so myself. But I was really interested to hear from you because you've used bear in a new and different way than any of the stories I've heard. Do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about it? Yes. So I love bear in general, like in my regular life. Mm -hmm. But then about um, seven months ago, my parents, both of them, got really, really sick. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, you know, yeah. it's kind of fresh. Yeah. So my mother went into hospice, mm -hmm. and the minute she went into hospice, my dad just got one thing after another, congenital heart disease and kidney disease and a blood disorder, like anything, everything. Yeah. And so my sister and I, who live on the East Coast, mm -hmm ended up going to Pittsburgh where they live. Um, and we spent months there because they were so sick. And that's when I like really turned to Bear to help me get grounded and navigate through this most stressful thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, wow. So. What did you notice? Okay, so both of your parents sick, your father declining, hospice. What was it about the bear process that really helped you stay grounded and navigate that? So, you know, it was one of those situations where you could just fall apart because mm -hmm. it was so awful. But I just decided I was going to literally go through each step and figure out how it could help me get through it all. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to tell you what I did? Yeah, tell me what you did. Okay, so step one, environmental detox. So there I was in my parents' little tiny cramped disorganized <laughs> apartment. Yeah. And my sister and I were in this little room with two little twin beds with, you know, pillows that were flat as pancakes and really old polyester gross yeah. sheets. I'm like, yeah. okay. <laughs> we're doing something. Let's start there. Right. So I literally like went to Marshall's. Mm -hmm. I bought a $20 pillow mm -hmm. that was comfortable. Yeah. I bought pretty pink satiny cotton sheets, mm -hmm. and I just redid my bed. Right. One little thing to make it a little bit nicer in my environment so that every night I had this lovely little bed to go through. Yeah. So there you go. Right. One little thing. Right. The next thing was pleasure. Like, how could I possibly find any pleasure in this horrible situation? But then I was like, okay, there's this great shoe store. I love these shoes. Hey! 
Okay. <laughs> Check them out. We both love shoes, we obviously. Both. Those yes. are hot. Thank you. Love shoes. And um, Pittsburgh, we, they were in Pittsburgh, also have this amazing pancake place mm -hmm. that Barack and Michelle Obama always go to when they're in Pittsburgh. So I'm like, okay, once a week, I'm going to buy a new pair of shoes <laughs> and I'm going to go eat pancakes. I'm going to have boots and pancakes. Yes. We need t-shirts. Yes. Oh my God. And, and like, you know, it was a little thing, but like, you know, just adding a little bit of pleasure made, made getting through it a little nicer. Yeah. So again, wow. little things. Right. Okay. So that was two. So, so three. Um, so you call it sweat. Yep. I, I also call it moving with love. Yes. So I would just wake up and I'd say, okay, you know, to my body, what do you need? What would feel like love to get through this? And usually it was just go outside, go for a walk, get some fresh air. But sometimes it might be stretching. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be, you know, doing a plank, getting a little strength. Right. But I would just like, I would ask and I would listen to what my body said. And I would do that. So it was just a little bit of movement. So all these things, just little things made this horrible situation a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, when you were eating said pancakes, yes. I'm guessing attentiveness yes. was key. Right. So mindful eating. So, mm -hmm. so again, through bear, mm -hmm. I look at food, pleasure food or power food. Not good or bad, none mm -hmm. of that. And I knew I was in a really stressful situation. So yes, there were def definitely the hardest step. Um, and definitely days when it was a lot of pleasure slash comfort eating. But here's the difference with Bear. I didn't beat myself up, up over it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a horrible, bad thing. It wasn't like eating to get rid of the feelings. It was like, right. I'm going to mindfully, slowly eat these pancakes or whatever else it was and be okay with it. But eat it slowly, which you pay attention to what my stomach, my body was telling me. And, you know, then I usually had one serving and it was good enough. Right, right. So that was kind of the mindful Amazing. eating yeah. part. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't like I was trying to restrict myself or was mean to myself. It was like, okay, have some pancakes. Have but some pancakes and down. some boots. And get some boots. <laughs> Look good while you're eating those pancakes. <laughs> All right. And okay. then. Okay, so what's okay, left? Okay, so closet detox. Okay. So again, in the tiny room with the two twin beds. There's a little dresser crammed full of stuff my parents never use and a closet crammed full of clothes that they never wear. Right. I mismatched hangers, right. by the way. Right. <laughs> so first I emptied two of the drawers, so I just had a little bit of space. Then I took three feet in that closet and I took off all their clothes. It was, it was my mom's clothes that she was never going to wear again. Right. And I folded them and I put them in the corner and once again, again ran off to Marshall's and I bought 25 felt hangers yep. for 10 bucks Yep. and then put all my clothes on them so when I opened the closet, there, were my, there was my three feet of space and my two drawers. And you know, again, I know these are little things yeah. in a dire situation, but it like, for a minute, it was like, okay, I'm organized, this feels good. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was all right. Mm -hmm. Then. Well, I mean, and these little things really add up to how you feel in the moment when you're navigating such a traumatic, grieving, uh, heavy situation, you were using the tools the best that you could. Yes. And that's the point. Progress, yeah. not perfection, and like doing what you can and what feels like love. Yes, yes. Constantly asking that question, what feels like love. Mm -hmm. And then the last step, make it seen. Well, you know, that was just my life because mm -hmm. I was just constantly either doing dealing with the hospice team you know nurses aid social workers or with whatever specialist team my dad needed at the time but just constantly politely but assertively getting whatever they needed like right. taking care of them as best as i could right so these seven steps really grounded me and got me through the hardest period in my life so far i know it seems obvious if you're watching this documentary but don't go on a diet as we've illustrated over and over and over again, diets don't work. All they do is set you up for mental and physical health setbacks. One of the greatest skills I've learned that has changed my entire life and changes all of my clients' lives who learn it, mind detox is probably the best life skill you could ever learn. Pay attention to your thoughts learn how to observe what you're telling yourself and learn how to create good mental hygiene. All right, so everybody at this table <laughs> is somebody who likes to sweat. Yes. yes. 
<laughs> and in very different ways. Mm -hmm. So when I say move with love, what comes up for you, Robert? Oh my gosh, move with love means like, how can I take care of me? Mm -hmm. Like how can I consider me at the top of the day, mm -hmm. you know? And so something that changed for me this year was like, I love to dance, obviously. But how can I also find low impact activities that make me feel so good about myself, not about a product, but like on the inside. So for me, that's like waking up at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and getting on that bike at Soul Cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And that feels like moving with love because it's like I'm choosing me at the top of my day. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it feel like like a prayer? Like we went to Soul Cycle together today. Yeah. And like, you know, there so were jealous. There was totally a moment where I was like in tears. Mm -hmm. Like it does, there's something, there's a serious mind body connection that it's so much bigger than losing weight. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that uh, is like, the, the last thing <laughs> to, to be thinking about. It's totally. like, how do I move this body in a way that shows myself that I am celebrating the fact that I'm alive. Yes. And I love it when I get your videos via text where you're like, I'm walking down the street to Soul Cycle. Yes. And I'm like, like yes. I am in pitch black. But I feel like your body, those tears are like your body applauding you. Like yes. saying, thank you for seeing me and for honoring me and for like trusting that I'm gonna get you through this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? it's like an emotional release. Yeah. When I, um, I bought my Peloton because there was a member of the Bear community that for whatever reason, up until that point, I couldn't get her to buy into the idea mm -hmm. to move with love. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, all of a sudden started posting about this Peloton bike. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> and she was raving about it to the point that I was like, I gotta investigate this. Yeah. And I have never been a fan of spin. I think prior to that, I'd maybe been to one or two very terrible spin classes. <laughs> so I thought I hated it. And so um, I just posted a question on my Facebook page about Peloton. This is not a commercial for Peloton, but it yeah. sounds like it. <laughs> anyway my Facebook blew up yes. and I'm like, okay. So I ordered one on a whim yeah. and they set it up the day before Thanksgiving last year. And I remember I was like, what have I done? Yeah. Like, <laughs> this is going to be like an expensive coat rack. And um, <laughs> I seriously was like, what have you done? And I'm like, just get on it. You've got to at least try it. Yes. Like you can't like not even try. Mm -hmm. So I got on it and the tears were just Boring. I, it was so unexpected to yes. me because I was already someone who ran pretty much daily and looked at weights. And I felt like this was a form of movement that was a celebration in a totally different way. Yes. And I felt like I had my own coach yeah. on that bike. Yeah. Um, and it was, to me, it was such a surprise mm -hmm. that we get locked into these ideas mm -hmm. that there are only certain ways we enjoy movement mm -hmm. and there's only certain things we're willing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what a shock, what a surprise, yes. what a freaking miracle yeah. that I, like at the end of my day, which is also something I said I would never do, look forward mm -hmm. to getting on that bike and spinning out like whatever emotion mm. I've been holding all day for clients or you know just the stress of the day or whatever it might be like getting that emotion out and for my own mental health moving yes. in a way that is a celebration not a punishment oh yeah, yeah. for sure i think movement and mental health are highly connected mm -hmm. yes well i mean i teach people that all the time that I mean, one has to feed the other. Yes. That, you know, it's like when you take medication for depression and you don't talk about it. To me, I'm like, exercise is the the, the most underused yet free antidepressant there is. In the oh, world. I totally so, agree. And, and people don't step into it. So mm -hmm. I keep doing more and more research about it. And the people I work with, I'm like the body shows you when you see how strong you are, how powerful you are in the rest of your life. Yes. No matter what, if it's yoga, stretching, whatever it is. And I also notice too, with my mind and where it goes throughout the day, when I'm doing something active, I'm fully present. Yes. I'm there, Same. all that yeah. other, because you have to or else you could hurt yourself, right. but yes. you're totally focused on yourself. I yeah. tell women a lot of times, get in front of a mirror, which just, drives some people crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm a big champion of group exercise. I think yeah. it's so good to do that. And yes. It's hard for people to do yeah. that. But I'm like, meet yourself there. Right? Yes. Because you'll meet yourself here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is an unwinding 
of right. so many years of brainwashing with yeah. diet culture that of course it's not going to be a quick overnight fix. Right. But what have you noticed over the past eight months since you started practicing attentive eating? Um, so, so the first thing that I went through, my body was, was like double dog dare in me. You know, I would go into Starbucks and I would see a Rice Krispie treat and I would think, oh, you know, I can't have that. And my mm -hmm. body would be like, well, you know, it was just like this little like fight. Mm -hmm. And I had to, so it's like, no, I like if my body wants something sweet, there's a reason for it, and I can have a I can have a Rice Krispie treat. Yes, you can. You know, <laughs> like, I eat like, the Rice Krispie. Right, and it was and it was one of those things where my body is like, you know, it, it, she did not trust me. Mm. So she was like, you know, I know you're going to go back on a diet. I know you're going to do this to me. I know you're not going to, you know, you're not mm -hmm. going to take care of me. And I would have to kind of like prove to myself, no, it's like, yes, I'll have the ice cream cone. Yes, I'll eat the Rice Krispie treat. Yes, I'll have the you know, second serving mm -hmm. of pasta, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. That all these things that I had like not allowed myself to eat right. for all of those years. And it was really odd. It's like once I would kind of like let myself, mm -hmm. then whatever that little drama was would just kind of melt away. Mm -hmm. And then, and, you know, and, and I'm kind of like through that whole, that whole drama period now. Right. Now I'm finally getting to a point where I actually believe mm -hmm. that I'm not going to put myself through this, that hell anymore. Nothing I did was because I loved myself. So it was always kind of abusive, if you think about it that way. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is an ab abuse cycle. Dieting's yeah. like that abusive boyfriend. Yeah. Like, it's just going to be better this time. And and the whole thing to diet culture is they're telling you that you're helpless. You can't do anything on your own. You know, you need this pill in order to be successful. Um, you can't do it. And even if you try, you're going to fail later and you're just going to revert back. You know, that's what the diet culture tells people, mm -hmm. that they will fail without their help. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's, it's so different realizing that no, I don't have to fail and it, food's not transactional. I can have a cupcake if I want to. Hell yeah. But I, and I love my red velvet. We talked about that yes, before. Yes, red velvet cake. <laughs> yes, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my gosh, I love them. Um, but if I feel like having something sweet, I have it. But I make living choices and I listen to my body more. So if I decide to eat two cupcakes that day and I realize, you know what, I didn't feel so great after that, then I know the loving choice would be just to have one. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't restrict me. It's not transactional. There's no abuse cycle going on. I'm just feeding my body to feel good. What makes me feel alive. Moving my body because I love myself, taking walks, enjoying the sunset with my son or my husband because I want to, not because I'm punishing myself for something. Right. There is nothing that's the same. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, but in, in all sincerity, I was not expecting that. With no offense intended, I was sincerely not expecting it because when you grow up the fat kid, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a diet, is a thing you hear a lot, and mm -hmm. it's always a lie. Yeah. So Susan Hyatt has this thing and it's not a diet. It's gonna change your life, but it's not a diet. And I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. But then it turns out Susan Hyatt's not a big fat liar. <laughs> so, okay, um, we can work with this. But since like every, again, every module in Bear has a specific thrust and every one of them addresses a very specific need mm -hmm. that I think contributes to body image and, and weight image and frankly, personal power issues. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I walk through the world wearing clothes that fit me now. Yeah. And I was wearing tents before. Mm -hmm. And at the very first bear event that I went to, I saw a picture of myself on a tent and I was like, I look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the, being fat cannot be worse than looking that ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I took my last down to the store and I bought some clothes that fit. And so now I feel better, Yeah. okay? Um, and it took me about six months to trust you about eating. Mm -hmm. And it took me reading your book like three or four times. It took me going to the back of your book and looking for the additional resources and mm -hmm. go doing some more homework and reading some more books and some more articles to finally say, okay, maybe if I say I can eat whatever I want and I just listen to my body, then I will not weigh 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that I started that in about May or June. Mm -hmm. And I did in fact gain some weight. So y'all mm -hmm. do not panic. There is a, mm -hmm. There's gonna be a little bit of a curve right. because the artificial scarcity under which you've been living for probably your entire adult and most of your adolescent life has impact. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to get rid of that impact. And I'm still not out from under it altogether. But um, I also got rid of my scale mm -hmm. because that was stressing me out. Yeah. So I'm like, what happened then was I had to sit down with my little self, mm -hmm. looking in the little mirror and say, okay, here's the thing. Do you want to be skinny? or do you want to have a healthy relationship with food? Yep. 
and I had to decide which was more important. When I was about 30 years old, I worked in an office. One of our computers broke down and a computer tech came and wanted to fix it. So I said, here's the patient. And he came in and said, the patient, huh? Well, hop up on this desk and take off your shirt. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So I felt humiliated, mm -hmm. I felt angry, but most of all I felt frustrated because I just didn't know how to handle that. Mm -hmm. So if that happened today, the technician would not have... Uh, would not live? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't get the same reaction as the, the uh, young giggling girl who just walked away not knowing what to do. Right. After living there, after... And we're all, right, we're all a work in progress. Mm -hmm. We're all, like, constantly... Um, peeling back the layers of the onion and finding other ways in which diet culture has, has still permeated right. how we're moving in the world. Mm -hmm. But by and large, now, um, the way that you approach food and body, what's the feeling state that speaks to you about how you are now? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom is my number one guiding principle. Freedom. Joy. Ease. Glorious. Loved. Um, and it's not about what someone else is loving about me, and it's mm -hmm. what, I, what I love about myself. Mm -hmm. Empowered. I don't, it feels like you just don't have to like follow the rules anymore. I feel like the patriarchy and just society put so many rules on women on how we can behave and, and how we should have to act. Mm -hmm. And so Living Bear just feels like freedom to kind of just do what you want to do and be the best version of yourself. I would just walk into a room and change the energy. I don't do that intentionally. What I think I understand about myself is when I show up and I'm completely myself and I say hello to people and genuinely want to know them and um, make eye contact, see a stranger in the room that doesn't look like they know where they're supposed to be. Um, we were sitting at a table today, my friends Robert and Rachel, with people I'd never met and the two of them told me when we left, they said, I love how you are with people. Being free to be who you are, who you truly are, and loving yourself, and like, I'm super extra, and that's fine, and I wear glitter tennis shoes always, and that's fine, and. So you're a fan of the bear deck. I'm obsessed with it. Okay, so <laughs> tell me why. I'm obsessed with it because I didn't realize the power of it. Mm -hmm. in the sense that you released it and I ordered like 900 of them <laughs> and then I just started giving them away as Christmas gifts and then had the book and was you know giving those away to you know our students and parents and then I started using the deck whenever friends would come over for dinner parties at my place and one night I had a group of girlfriends over and we were having a great dinner we were winding down with dessert and I said okay everybody pull a card out within 30 seconds all four of us in tears mm -hmm. because the card met them exactly where they were mm -hmm. and they felt seen. Mm -hmm. And for them to then be able to express what that meant and then how they were going to reshape their week and mm -hmm. their view on themselves, like it, it was it was the conversation starter that I didn't know that we needed to have in our circle of friends, you know? So mm -hmm. thank you for that. You Thank know? you, Robert. But truly, to like put words together and then release it out into the world, the ripple effect, mm -hmm. you know, that anytime somebody touches that deck, like someone's life has changed, that's huge. It's just the whole idea of Bear, like when I looked at it and read it, it's so much of what I do you just kind of fine-tuned it for me mm -hmm. and let me see like, okay, I'm doing a lot of the right things for yeah. self-care and self-love. And then the conversation that happens in the studio for my women mm -hmm. is around that. Yeah. So we don't say negative things about our body when we enter the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's just this like, let's just have this positive space and hold sacred space mm -hmm. for you to feel amazing and mm -hmm. to feel good about yourself and your body. Mm. So yeah, that's just, and that's a space that I create. Yeah. And I love doing that for my women. So you run an amazing multi-million dollar company as well. Thanks, friend. <laughs> and you work with kids yeah. who want to be on Broadway. Yeah. And you're a Broadway star, hello! <laughs> so you are in an industry where how you look, how much you weigh, yeah. your body is the focus. Right. So when you're working with these kids, um, what's the messaging you want them to embrace? 
The messaging that we always want to embrace is that everybody is a Broadway body. And I think that as we go into this new wave of storytelling, there is a new revival of West Side Story on Broadway. And everyone looks like someone that you would see on the street. There are different shapes, there are different sizes, there are different gender expressions, sexuality expressions, there are men, you know, dancing with other men, there are women dancing with gender non-conforming people, and I just think it's so beautiful because so many students, like, you know, when I was going to school, it was how straight could you make yourself yeah. to then be able to fit into the mold. Right. And so, again, shrink 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 versus what would the pleasure feel like of being you and experiencing for me as a gay person my gayness on stage right and so i'm so excited to allow you know i'm gonna have our students go see the show and take them there and for them to be able to see you know these gender non-conforming kids yeah. who are fluid to be able to see themselves on stage is going to be so special because it's something that I didn't have growing up as a kid who hoped to make it to Broadway. I must have been like maybe four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm already fat because we've already established that. And I went missing. My mom couldn't find me because I was sitting in our bright ass orange 1970 <laughs> whatever Oldsmobile car because I had seen on television that sweating makes you lose weight. Mm. So I put on my little red bathing suit with the silver stars and put my little fat ass in that car so I could stop being a little fat ass. Mm. And if that doesn't tell you how unhealthy the world that we live in is that a freaking, I'm gonna say five, let's just be generous, but five. Mm -hmm. That a five year old thinks that a car sauna is an appropriate response to yeah. her weight. Then um, if, if that's not wrong for you, then I can't help you. Right. <laughs> So if you could climb in that car and say something to her, what would you say? Get your ass out of the car and go live your life. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. quit. Right. And there's nothing wrong with a fat little four-year-old. There's nothing wrong, right? <laughs> like nothing. There's so much more for the taking in every single way. All the dreams I had, I think sometimes in my 48-year-old self, there's, it was an embracing of my 13 year old self from back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had the short hair then, I wore the different clothes, I sort of saw myself as this sort of punk rock French girl, and now I'm just like <laughs> the mom who's like that. <laughs> and I think I would have told myself, go within and go to that part of yourself and, and bring it forth. You know, my career, I've been, I went to graduate school, therapist, life coach. I'm a model at 46 years old. I mean, all the things that travel and see the world, which you and I have done so much of, I think telling myself, don't put it all on hold and um, letting myself enjoy it versus questioning everything. I wish I had been more successful with my own middle schooler when she was in middle school with this. Um, and I wish I had known not to model like not going into the pool because of a bathing suit kind of thing. I wish I had done better at that. Um, so I might tell him that. Yeah. I might just tell him that. I might just say, you know, I kind of missed the boat on this with my own daughter, and, and I really regret that. And I wish for you that you just, well, first of all, try, the hard, I think the hardest thing for most people is to catch on to their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. You have this little inner monologue all the time, and you think it's true. And mostly it isn't. <laughs> and mostly most of us grab onto the negative thing just honestly because of evolution. Negative sticks more. So try to get aware of your own meanness. And also call out the meanness of others. And stop stop this mean girl bullshit. I mean, if you are not an advocate for other girls. That your weight does not determine who you are or what you're worth. That you are so much more and how you look, it's not just, you know, you have so much more to offer than your body, mm -hmm. you know, and society tells us that, that, you know, that's what you have, is how you look. As a woman, that's not true. There's so much more to offer. What would you love to say to that 13, 14 year old, if you could? Um, oh my gosh. The size that I am, my hair, my makeup, the clothes that I'm wearing, like none of those things really matter. Like, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm showing up this size, and I'm showing up with my hair a mess and no makeup on, and people are loving me. 
And it's like, and, I, and for so many years I thought if I wasn't perfect, if I didn't have everything just like laid out in the perfect way and the perfect path and just like everything in my life was just like a magazine, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be loved and accepted. And I have learned that that's not the truth, that I can be exactly who I am in this body and that people will love and accept me for who I am. What your process, what the bear process does, is it does that inner work, mm -hmm. which we so desperately need. Mm -hmm. Because we just gloss over everything and we're looking on the outside when inside we're feeling like crap. Yeah. And doing that work is that inner work, which mm -hmm. is so ugly sometimes, mm -hmm. that is um, essential for people to have that growth. And I think when they work through those issues, mm -hmm. uh, which you so beautifully put in your book, to work, have people work through those things and then they can truly thrive. Mm -hmm. I hope that they see possibility, whether it be on a Broadway stage or whether it be in Congress, I hope that they look at themselves and they say, I can do anything that I put my mind and my heart and my feet to. What would you today tell that teenager who's popping diet pills? Stop, stop the madness. Mm -hmm. You're better than that. She doesn't need to listen to other people. She just needs to listen to her heart and whatever she is telling herself to do instead of other people. So if you could go back and tell your younger self who was stressed out, um, emotionally eating, um, judging her booty, you know, saying like, you know, this isn't good enough one way or the other, what, what would you say to her? Can I flip your question? Yeah, flip it. So I have flipped that question to, what do I want my 99 year old self to tell me? <gasps> I love this. This is why you're paid the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and because I can't do anything about that 20 year old girl, mm -hmm. but I can look ahead to, I want 99 year old Renee to say, girl, you did that thing. Oh! You have no <laughs> dream on the table. That's what, you know? I'm going to cry. <laughs> so, you yes. have no dream on no the table. No dream on the table. And Bear supports that for me. I hope you'll join me on the Bear Revolution. There are so many ways that you can participate. You can pick up the Bear book at your local library, online, off of Amazon, or at any major bookseller in your local community. You can also find me online. Join my free Facebook group, Bear Nation. You can listen to the Bear Podcast. You can also join the paid community, Bear Daily. And lastly, if you feel like you want to devote your life's work to helping girls and women kick diets to the curb and learn how to love the skin they're in, I train and certify coaches all over the world to do this. Whether you want to go into schools like the one you saw in this documentary and teach girls how to stop dieting and how to love themselves, or you want to work one-on-one -on -one with women, join me, check out the information. I would love to welcome you to Bear Nation.
question for you. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in becoming a bear certified coach? I actually wanted to. I think I filled out one of your things once um, because I would love to help other women mm -hmm. realize that they are, they are not worthless as they feel because I know what that feels like. Um, and I don't know what I would specialize in yet, but you know, well, I so was interested. So you have interested. a scholarship. <laughs> Will you have really? a scholarship to oh. become a bear coach whenever you're ready? Really? Okay. Yeah. I do. I, I do want to. I want to help other women so much and it's I, on you want to start in february you can start in february if you want to wait until the baby's a little older you can wait until the baby's a little february older. is good the month of valentine's the month of love when she fell in yes, love with herself yes yes <laughs> <laughs> i'm so excited thank you thank you